What's going on everybody? You already know who it is. It's yours truly, Chris Bender, and I am so excited to be with my Motivation family right now in this current moment. And I'm so excited to share with you all what I believe the Lord is saying to us. Um, this is a great opportunity. I wanna send my love and our celebration to our pastors. Come on, make some big stadium noise for PJ and PR right now, let's go. We love you all so much. Thank you so much for trusting us uh, to take care of the house while y'all are resting and, and recovering. I love you all so much and praying God's best over your time of retreat. All right, y'all, so let's dive into the words. I'm so excited to share this. I really believe that it's gonna bless you. Um, let's read. If you have your Bibles, if you're on your phone, I can understand that you might not, you might not be able to swap and switch like you want to, but it's okay. I'm gonna read it for you, then I'm gonna give you a little, uh, a little um, synopsis of the entire chapter so that you can have a context of what I'm talking about okay let's read first Kings 17 24 reads then the woman told Elijah now I know that for sure you are a man of God and that the Lord truly speaks through you again that is first Kings 17 and 24 in the book of Kings, 1 Kings 17 um, it tells us and teaches us about the journey that Elijah had into the land of Zarephath in Zarephath, there was a drought going on. Um, the Lord had instructed Elijah to go there so that he could be taken care of by a widow woman. Elijah had no idea who this woman was, where she was going to be, what her story was. All Elijah had was his faith and his obedience to and in God, right? So he goes to the land of Zarephath and he waits. And certainly as the Lord promised, it happens to be, and it comes to pass that he comes into contact with this widow woman from Zarephath. And he tells this woman that he needs to be fed and needs some water. And she tells him in response, almost like my mother would have told a guest at our home, I don't have anything for you. This is all left for my son. Uh, in particular, so I'll, uh, I want to make sure that I'm being uh, directly reflective of the scripture itself. She tells Elijah that she only has a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil and a little water. And she has set that aside and she's reserved it for her and her son to eat in which she knows or senses that her son is going to die. So she tells Elijah, listen, I don't know what, what God told you. I don't know how he got it to you. I don't know if he dropped it by way of a, of a, a dove or an eagle. I don't know. But all I know is that what I have left is for my son who I know is soon to die. Elijah tells the woman that if she would obey the voice of God through him by faith, she will never have a day where her cupboards will go empty. Now, I remind you, we're in the middle of an entire drought in the land of Zarephath. And Elijah is telling this woman, if you trust the God in me, I for sure will guarantee you that he will never let his word fall to the ground. Oh my God. Now I can imagine the woman being in a, a perplexed state and not knowing what exactly was going to, um, being in a space where you have to be led by and follow faith first can be very, very challenging. Wouldn't you say that? It's hard to really identify how I'm supposed to trust beyond what I'm faced with or what I see. But there there has to be a level of there has to be a level of investment in what it is that you've you have to have an investment in your history with God to trust what your future in him would look like. Got to. So the woman obeys the voice of God through Elijah and she prepares for Elijah bread and provides for him some water, which was her last. The question that I have to throw your way is, do you trust God with your last? How easy is it for you? If I think about you know, I wear a couple of different hats, right? You know, Chris, the, the gospel artist, the worship leader, the life coach, the cousin, the brother, the, the counselor, you know, a little bit of everything, right? But if I put on the hat of the worship leader for a moment and I thought about my experience as a participant in worship and then an actual worship leader, I would, I would ask the question, how often is it 
that you are able to worship God knowing that things are not well wherever you are before you get to the house of the Lord. How easy is it for you to come into the presence of God with the people of God and freely worship him, knowing that there are still bills that have not been paid, knowing that <laughs> there's a shut off notice that you got on your kitchen table, knowing that there's been a pink slip delivered to your office, knowing that there is some there's some component of life that you are experiencing in a great way. How often is it that we are able to come into the worship experience and worship God freely? Do you trust God enough to worship him freely knowing that you're at your wit's end? Just like that woman in Zarephath, that widow woman, we find ourselves in these experiences countless times. I know even myself reading this, and in studying it, I've seen myself in so many different areas and components um, and stages in my life, right, where I've been challenged to believe God, to serve God, to serve God's people, to trust God and do for God in the name of God, even when I haven't had everything for Chris. And it's been completely challenging. However, I've learned one one very, very sure thing in those experiences, right? The enemy is after your psyche while God is after the cycle. We find ourselves consistently in spaces where we are challenged to either go all the way in blind. PJ talks about all the time, blind obedience. We find ourselves in consistent spaces where we can either follow blind obedience all the way through to the manifestation of what God has promised or we can find ourselves in a very perplexed space and stay there and find ourselves in environments and communities and people and people and excuse me, in groups that don't really help to push us from that space. And this woman in this moment, I can see that, you know, in my in my imagination, I could see that her enemy, the enemy, right, was after her psyche. He was really challenging and, and, and putting her in a space where mentally she was weighing out the, the, the risk factor, right, of all of what she could lose or gain if she trusted this man. All the while, God has sent someone to break the cycle that she was going to experience that she never knew was coming. Let's dig, let's dig a little further. So, there are now that we have a base on the, the 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 scripture right and we have a base of what it was that was happening in kings i, I want to share three points and perspectives with you that will help you to position yourself when you're entertaining a miracle because that's exactly what elijah was for her elijah was the the bridge between the widow woman and the miracle if we look a little further into the into the chapter, we see that the widow woman's son ends up dying. She finds Elijah and she almost tries to come at Elijah like, yo, what did you do? Like, I I could have probably I can imagine what she was thinking. Like, I probably could have sustained my son's life. I could have I could have possibly had him a little longer. I, I probably could have given him something that he needed to. He probably needed to be nourished. And I could have given him some nourishment or some form of nourishment through the meal that I had last prepared. Like, I could imagine her being so angry, not just with Elijah, but then now ultimately with God, because it was God that sent Elijah to tell her to give up her last. Goes and takes the son who is now dead takes him to the upper room and he cries out to God over the remains of this widow woman's son. And the Lord hears Elijah's cry and brings life back to that young man's body and he lives. And so Elijah was the bridge that this widow woman needed to attain her miracle. But she didn't know that she was entertaining it. <laughs> Isn't it crazy how sometimes we can we can be in the position where we are at the break of expectation becoming manifestation. We are at the edge of breakthrough becoming ours completely. We're at the, at the point of that place and that space where God is going to perform what it is that we've been looking for, but we are we're almost faced with that one last test from God to see if we will be open enough to allowing him to do what it is that he wants to do in his fullness, in its fullness. Let's keep going. There's, there's three things, there's three perspectives that I want to share with you that will help you position yourself 
when you're entertaining a miracle, something like the widow woman was with Elijah. The first point, entertaining your miracle requires you to submit what's left to the one who has what's next. If you think about the scripture again, the woman had to give up her last meal to Elijah. She had to submit it to Elijah for Elijah to have to enjoy in expectation of whatever it was that God was going to do for her. Right. Have you ever been on the edge of giving it all up for the sake of obedience? What you have is nothing compared to what God has. The woman was very eerie, as we've seen in the scripture of the idea of sacrificing everything that she had, her last for the man of God. However, she obeyed. How much is on the other side of your obedience that you haven't received yet? How many blessings, how much healing for your family, how much revelation, how much restoration for those relationships that have been rocky is on the other side of the door of obedience. You just haven't walked through it yet. And what would be the reason why you haven't walked through the door of obedience? Is it trust? Is it fear? Is it anger? Is it bitterness? Is it trauma? What is what is causing you to be reluctant about a door that is required? First Kings 17 and 17 through 23 is where we see that the widow's son dies and she begins to doubt not only the man that God sent, but ultimately I would believe that she started to doubt God as well. But the same man that she submitted her last to was the same man that had the miracle that she needed for the perspectives and the points that could actually help you position yourself when you are entertaining a miracle. Point number two. Here we go. You have to trust that this is your last time at your last. My God. You know, what? if we weren't where we were, I would probably start running. But I'm going to hold my peace. But I want you to do me a favor. I want you to drop that in the chat. I need you to type this. Type, this is my last time at my last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Matter of fact, while you're typing it, I need you to repeat it. Say it. This is my last time at my last. Oh, yeah. Come on. Let's do the work. So 1 Kings 17, 14 through 15 says, For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be flour and olive oil in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she, the widow woman, did as Elijah said. And she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. So the... The interesting word at the beginning of this second mantra, right, is trust. And the Bible, the word of the Lord tells us that we have to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts and lean not to our own understanding. And in all of our ways, acknowledge him and he will direct our paths. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because it is one of the most vital scriptures, in my opinion, for anyone that is in a space where they're struggling with their faith and obedience in God. Because I feel like the base and the root of both faith and obedience is trust. I have to have some level of trust in. I have to have some level of trust in my doctor to be committed to what he says and then apply it to do it. We got to have some type of level of trust in our in our chefs and our cooks at restaurants. If we're committing to not only ordering the food, but we're also going to eat the food as well. No one orders food and just lets it sit on the table. Right. There's a level of trust that is required when you are walking this thing out in faith and in obedience with the Lord. And so we dig into what causes us to fall into a place of distrust. Because if trust is the base and the root, we got to deal with that so that we can't so we won't struggle in faith and with obedience. What causes us to have distrust in God? What is that thing for you? What has caused you to struggle in trusting the Lord completely? What is that thing for you? Was it the failed relationship? Was it the not so 
satisfying doctor's report? Is it is it you seeing failure all around you and believing that because it's around you, it has to be your portion as well? What is causing distrust for you? Take a minute to think about that. This is the last point, and I want to make sure that you, you know what? I hope that you've been taking notes. And if you haven't taken notes while you're watching it live, it's all right. We're going to leave the replay up somewhere. Either check out the YouTube page or the Facebook page and make sure you subscribe while you're at it. That I hope that you've taken notes. You know, PJ tells us that 90% of individuals that take notes make it to heaven. And I think you're trying to get there too. Last point, point number three, obey the request. Expect the miracle. Um, Psalms 37 and 5 says, commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. What God has in store for us, family, will always supersede what we currently have. The Lord is ready to assist us at any given point in our day. At any moment in time, he's willing and ready to assist us. However, we have to fully lean into what the Father is asking, requesting, and requiring of us immediately. Not just for what he can do for us, but as sons and daughters of God, family, I believe that it is our responsibility and it should be our will and our desire and our passion to always obey his voice fully, completely, and immediately. One of the greatest offenses to our faith is our logic and we must follow him all the way beyond what society says beyond what our own personal preferences are beyond what we might even feel in the moment our our posture must always be god lead i follow i think you need to write that in the chat god leads i follow so what i love most about reading this chapter is what most people celebrated in, in, the, in the groups that I talked to about the scriptures, um, and it was the idea that what most people were rejoicing about was the idea that the widow woman's covers never went dry. But what was even more phenomenal than that was the concept and the reality also that the woman got more than what she expected from God based on her obedi obedience to God. Her son died and she was helpless. She couldn't bring him back to life. There was no doctor. There was no surgeon. There was no there was no medication that she could have been in in close proximity of or to that could have produced for her what it was that she needed for her son to come back to life. But she had obedience to God. And because of her obedience to God, it was almost like. God said to, you know, either said to himself, like, you know, I can find this woman faithful of this act because of what she was able to give up for me. It's a beautiful thing to know that we serve a God and, and we live and, and have our being and trust in a God that never just gives us what we ask for. Or even, let's go a step further, let's look at the scripture. He never just gives us what he said, but he always exceeds whatever it is that he said he was going to do. And it gives us such a base, this, this, this entire chapter gives us such a, a, a hope and a surge of, of energy to trust in our God, to obey him, and to lean completely on his matchless capabilities. There is nobody else, family, that can do for us and that can be to us what God is, what God does. And so all in all tonight and in this moment, I, I, I hope that you were able to watch the sequence of this chapter and how God took this widow woman and her son through a journey of faith and obedience. And not only did he take them through the journey, but he rewarded them for their commitment to the journey as well. My question to you to, uh, in this moment is, how much are you willing to commit in obedience, in faith, in trust to the journey that God has you on? How important, how vital is that to you right now? 
and how much more vital do we need to make it? How much of a priority in your life is your trust in the Lord? How much of a priority in your walk is obedience to God? How much, how much of, a, of, a, of, a, of an importance is trust is, you know, the, the, the idea around faith in God in your journey? My prayer for you today, my prayer for you in this moment is that you will leave this, this lesson, this experience, this moment of sharing with an incentive from the Bible itself on the worth of trusting in God. They used to teach us that in this is Bible, some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but we will always trust in the name of the Lord. Why? Because the, it's the name. Not even we haven't even gotten to his works yet. His name alone is a strong tower. And the righteous, that's us, we can run into the safety of his name and find that safety for our lives. So I'm getting ready to check off or check out. I'm checking out of here. But I want you to remember that there is more on the other side of you trusting in the Lord. There's more to the uh, there's more on the other side of you having faith in God and obeying him than there is where you're standing right now. What's coming when you have faith in God and when you obey him is much better than what's been. I love you so much and I pray that you are encouraged and I pray that your faith increases. I pray that you find discipline in your walk. I pray that you find the courage to obey God beyond what society says. I pray that you find the courage to obey God beyond what the social groups that you're in say. I pray that you find the confidence and the strength to obey God, even when it's not popular. Because it might not be popular, but it will always be beneficial. I love you so much, Motivation Family. God's grace, God's peace be yours. In Jesus' name, amen. What's going on, Motivation Church? It's your boy, Mev. Listen, the streets have been talking and these masterclass series have been amazing. Our very own Chris Benders just laid down an amazing word. And if you missed it, you can catch us on YouTube, take a look at it on Facebook. And while you're at it, follow us on Instagram. If you have any questions, please let us know. And I hope you guys have a great week. Peace.